What all of this did, of course, was to lead me to question uh, some of the established 20th century theory of evolutionary biology. And when I first started doing this, um, giving lectures all the way from about 2010 onwards, slowly developing the theme, the response from orthodox neo-Darwinists can only be described as outrage. Have a look at my Wikipedia page if you want examples of that. One of those that's expressed <laughs> great outrage is Jerry Coyne, an evolutionary biologist at the University of Chicago. He's the only one I will name because he's named himself, so much so that he appears on my Wikipedia page. Well, my Wikipedia page, something that somebody's written for me. Um, and he writes, all his claims are wrong. Well, I could perhaps live with that. I think all claims, I mean, all theories in biology are wrong, when you think about it. I mean, they're all approximations to the truth. Uh, but that's not what he means, of course. Um, and he writes, however famous Noble may be in physiology, is a blundering tyro when it comes to evolutionary biology. Well, um, let's have a look. These are some of the quotes from the lions roaring. Here we go again, somebody arguing that Darwin's wrong. Those of you who've listened carefully to this lecture so far will realize that I actually think that Darwin was largely right, and he was particularly right in not excluding the inheritance of acquired characteristics, and in praising Jean-Baptiste Lamarck as a great biologist. So I have no idea how on earth well, I do. Let me uh, explain why I think that <coughs> bit of thinking arises. I think it arises because neo-Darwinism loves to claim that it's really just Darwinism writ large, as it were, and with 20th century insights like Mendelian genetics and, and so on, which of course is quite true, and we nobody would want to deny that the incorporation of Mendelian genetics into evolutionary biology led to some very great advances. All the mathematics of population genetics would not occur, or would not have occurred, I think, uh, with, without that. But there is a kind of political strategy here. You know, Darwin is up there as an icon, and if you can claim, as it were, that you are children of Charles Darwin, you're doing very well from the point of view of publicizing <coughs> your point of view. And I think that's the explanation. But it needs to be emphasized very clearly indeed that Darwin would not have recognized neo-Darwinism as his inheritance. The next one, his most moronic claim by far is the one on mutations not being random. Well, anybody who's listened to this lecture today could hardly go home thinking that I claim that mutations are not random. Actually, I do have a quibble. We don't actually, as physicists and mathematicians, fully understand how we would ever prove that mutations are really random. We can say they appear random, and that's fine enough, I think. Um, but it's not enough for a very simple reason. Not only do we not actually understand fully the mechanisms in the physical world that generate randomness, we understand some of them, but by no means all, um, it's also that if randomness is used, you may not see that at the level of genes and molecules. See, come back to the gas in a container. Imagine just a moment that gas is the molecules that bounce around in the cell. And from the viewpoint of a molecule, if it was represented as about this sort of size, the edge of the cell would be way back up in Aberdeen. The constraint is that very distant edge. You won't see that in the bouncing around of the molecules at the molecular level. Of course, once you've got the insight that there is a boundary, there is a constraint, you can then say, okay, we now understand 
that this has a particular pressure, it has a particular volume, uh, and so on. But the idea that I claim that mutations are not random, well, enough said. I know of not a single adaptation in organisms that is based on such environmentally induced and non-genetic change. You better read the literature, is my <laughs> comment on that one. And I finish this particular sequence of the lions roaring. Um, cells are transitory and DNA is not. That's taken, of course, straight from the selfish gene. You can only maintain that if you have a very strange view of DNA and its replicative ability. Incidentally, it's the strange view that Schrödinger had. And if somebody wants me during discussion to go through the detail of Schrödinger's error, I'm very happy to do so. It's in the new book, uh, Dance to the Tune of Life, and I think it's the first time that the full analysis of that error has been published. Um, so Cambridge University Press, you've got a, you've got a first on that, um, <laughs> at least on that particular issue. Now, the point is this. The natural error rate in copying is 1 in 10 to the 4. <laughs> in a genome of 3 billion base pairs, that's millions. What actually happens is 1 in 10 to the 10. Hardly a single error in copying a whole genome. How is that done? A whole army of proteins constrained by the lipids, which are not coded for, incidentally, by uh, DNA, orchestrates the correction so that you end up with the extraordinary fidelity of copying. The ability to be, as it were, not transient is a property of the cell. There is nothing other than a cell that enables that to be done. I think enough said on that one. So, I'm afraid at the meeting last week they met with a stone wall. And so I finish with my final conclusion, and I've left just a few minutes for discussion. Um, the conclusion is simply this, that organisms can and do and demonstrably do harness stochasti stochasticity precisely in order to generate functionality and that turns the neo-Darwinist synthesis on its head. The central claim, remember, is random mutations uh, accumulating slowly and then natural selection to distinguish between the results. If, on the contrary, you can harness stochasticity to direct it in particular ways, just as the immune system does, just as bacteria do when they're starved um, or deprived of their um, cilia and so on, you can end up with the evolutionary process being directional. And that is a huge change. We're not talking about tinkering with the modern synthesis. We're not talking about minor changes to the neo-Darwinist synthesis, we're talking about a very major change conceptually and the implications for economics, for political theory, for various other disciplines, philosophy included, that have taken over, and believe me they have, the price equation and all the various other mathematics of um, evolutionary biology are absolutely immense. Those equations are going to have to be revised and we're going to have to take account of the fact that there can be directionality and that nature has obtained free ride from physics as much as chemistry. So, just a bit of further reading. The first article there, which was published in the Journal of Physiology, um, demonstrates that the selfish gene theory is of no empirical use whatsoever in physiological investigation and there has been no answer to that article. It's been published now for five years. The second is the one that really got the lions roaring, which was published in, again, a journal of the Physiological Society, Experimental Physiology. Physiology is rocking the foundations of evolutionary biology. Actually, that idea, that, that title, was taken from the commentary in the PNAS article which published Joe Nadeau's work on the Apebec-1 deficiency transmission of epigenetic uh, information. 
the commentary article simply said that um, his work was rocking the foundations of genetics. Then a major issue of the Journal of Physiology, I think I had one just a minute or two ago, but I think it's downstairs, a few copies of it, which was devoted just two years ago to the um, focused theme that evolution evolves. And um, finally, the article that, as it were, led to the writing of Dance to the Tune of Life, which has just been published, um, which is in the Journal of Experimental Biology, Evolution Beyond Neo-Darwinism. And I end the lecture with this quote, that nature is even more wondrous than the architects of the modern synthesis thought, and it involves processes previously believed impossible. Physiology is back, and it's back with a vengeance. Thank you very much.